you have arrived at The Winding Stairs, a program dedicated to Masonic education and the art of self-improvement. I am your host, Juan Sepulveda, a professional artist and master mason, 32nd degree of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite in Freemasonry. Hello and welcome once again to another episode of The Winding Stairs. Today I want to bring you an interview that I had with a brother that I admire incredibly, a very wise brother who has shared a lot of Masonic light with thousands of people around the world. And today we have an opportunity to speak with him about a topic that I think it's of importance at this stage in our organization where we see around us so many negative numbers of membership declining, participation being almost non-existent. So I I wanted to inquire about the the possibility of one day classes being a solution or whether they were a detriment to the fraternity. I didn't quite know exactly what what would happen uh, if we looked at the numbers. And on this conversation with brother Chris Hodap, uh, he revealed some things that I didn't know about the one day classes. And I think that you'll find some of this information very interesting. And there is actionable advice here that you can take to your lodge in order for you to handle membership and participation in a different way. So I think you'll enjoy this episode of The Winding Stairs because it has a lot of surprises and it has practical implementation of, of things that can have a positive effect in the fraternity. I hope you find this episode edifying and without further delay, here is my interview with Brother Chris Hodap on The Winding Stairs. This is definitely a topic that I think that we have to talk about it for two reasons. Uh, one of them, because I, for everything I see, it just doesn't work in the long run. And the second aspect of it is that there is an animosity against the brothers that go through this process. These guys are stigmatized and, and it really becomes offensive to literally tens of thousands of guys who came through that way frequently with no choice in the matter. And, uh, you know, now, in fairness, the the lunatic days of the mid-2000s where it just reached epic proportions uh, have largely gone away. Um, you know, I mean, in, in 2000 and whatever it was, 2001, 2002, Grand Lodge of Ohio raised almost 8,000 guys in one day. Wow. And, I mean that was just madness. And was did you do you think it was a trend that other Grand Lodges were emulating at the time as well? Yeah, uh, it, it, here's what happened. The, in fairness, the, the Grand Lodge of Washington D.C. actually started them in eh, I don't know the early '90s or so, and um, they didn't really catch on until the Shrine changed their membership requirements. Prior to 2000 and 2001, I think, um, the Shrine required that you be a Master Mason and that you had to go all the way through either the York Rite or the Scottish Rite. And, and then you could join the Shrine, but you had to go through one of the two rites first. Um, so that was guaranteed membership for the Scottish Rite and the York Rite. Hmm. Well, Shrine comes along 2001, says, holy crap, we're losing hundreds of thousands of, of members due to the death rate. we got to do something. So uh, we don't want to get rid of the Masonic connection, but let's get rid of the requirement for the rights. And that's what they did. So suddenly, the York Rite and the Scottish Rite were left out in the cold from their guaranteed water slide of new members. Hmm. So at that point, you had huge pressure from, in particular, the Scottish Rite, really leaning on the Grand Lodges to do something about it. 
And so they, they, they saw what the District of Columbia had been doing with one-day classes and said, let's try them as a huge event. Hmm. And they'd have 100 or 200 guys. Well, suddenly Ohio comes along in 2002 and does 8,000, and, and everybody goes berserk. My suddenly goodness. you got all these Grand Lodge guys looking at the figures and saying, Here's a way to fix the problem. And and so they went out and started pimping their own massive um, events. And nobody ever achieved what Ohio did ever again. Nobody even came close to it. But that was their gold standard of of you know, just coldly looking at numbers and saying, you know, here's what we'll try and do here in our state. Um, that almost sounds like whenever a new drug is introduced, <laughs> it has to go, <laughs> and everybody prescribes it, <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knows what the side effects are in the long term. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so now, on it, at the same time, there was there was a second track going on at the same time in that decision making what else was going on was you had the enormous death rate of the world war two generation guys really kicking in at that point and so you had these massive plummets in membership numbers due to the death rate every year hmm. so the the effect of that at the local lodge level was you were wiping out tons of older members who were the guys that were doing the ritual work. The younger guys didn't know the ritual work that well, and the older guys had kept it going. And suddenly, with them dying out in such massive numbers, you had lodges all over the country that were no longer able to put on all three of the degrees competently. I see. Um, so... So Grand Lodges were in a situation of, of looking at enrollment figures and saying, look, we have all these hundreds of guys that come in, get their EA degree, and then the Lodge can't manage to, to find guys to put on the fellow craft or Master Mason. Wow. So here's a way to solve that. You do a one-day class, then the Lodge doesn't have to do the rest of the degree work, We'll get the best guys in the state to put on the degrees for these big presentations, and that'll solve the problem. And so it was a it was a it was a two way tree of thinking that was going on at the time, and and so they kind of fed off of each other the shrine business and this lack of competent ritual guys. Um. So the now when you study this stuff and Grand Lodges have studied it for over thirty years, ever since DC started doing them, what they discover is the participation rate and the retention rate between guys who come through their degrees traditionally versus a one day class situation the participation rate and retention rate are exactly the same. Wow. It makes no difference. If, if, you know, if a lodge only retains, after five years, if a lodge only retains 25% of its new members, then that's the rate. It doesn't matter whether they came through in a one day or whether they came through traditionally. It makes absolutely no difference to the bottom line. Interesting. So you'll have people that have been trying to peg the kind of membership to one day classes but when you look at the numbers it doesn't support it so there's well, a, yeah there's yeah, a variable basically. missing of course that has to be more uh, has a, a, a sure impact on on the decline of membership and the lack of retention and participation uh, what would you say part of that what you say one of the variables that's affecting that is uh, I, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. Um, so if, if one day classes is not the culprit of 
lack of participation. In, oh, in wow. Well, <laughs> am I being recorded here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, if there's anything you want off the record, I would love you to let me know. <laughs> because, because the real answer is shitty lives experiences. Yeah. You know, it, it comes down to, I, I, I say this over and over again everywhere I go. No Grand Lodge ever, anywhere on the face of the earth, forced a lodge to have bad ritual work, lousy food, uh, no Masonic education, political infighting. You know, no Grand Lodge forces anybody to do that. Exactly. There aren't any rules that make that crap happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that comes down to how good or how bad the local lodge is. And Grand Lodges can pass all the rules they like and come up with all the programs they like. Nothing's going to fix that at the statewide level. Hmm. That, that makes it, really, it really comes down to how good a job the local lodge is doing. Well, it, it, there is a lot of work to do. And, and clearly, I personally, I went through the experience that before joining masonry i had an expectation of what i would see behind closed doors of what the experience would be like and, yeah. gr and granted i had an amazing um initiatic experience we had very uh very able uh brothers that they they were very good at what they did and they left uh -huh. an impression in my mind the follow-through was the problem the, right and it, unfortunately there is hundreds of thousands of brothers out there who might be having a good experience in the initiation process, but then are faced with the nuts and bolts of what a, a meeting is like. Well, exactly. The, the most important meeting in a Mason's entire life is the fourth one that he goes to. Wow. It's, it's the, the first stated meeting that he goes to after receiving his three degrees. It's at that meeting that he'll judge his lodge and the whole fraternity by when he sees what goes on at that fourth meeting. That's a powerful now, thought. Now, you know, other, other meetings can affect that, other experiences can affect that, he can change his mind, but I'm telling you, that's when it's, it's first planted in his brain, what the hell did I just join? Mm -hmm. Because oh. that's the meeting that shows him what he just joined. And and if the meeting is all about if the meeting is all about why didn't Charlie fix the toilet last month, mm -hmm. uh, he might come back, he might come back two or three months, but it won't last. Yeah. The Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast is sponsored in part by Masonic Revival. I have seen many Masonic ties in the market, but the tie selection from Masonic Revival is among the best out there. I am sure you have seen some poorly designed ties with poor construction and materials. Not these ties. Brother Edgar has an impeccable sense of style and he has put it to the service of the craft. In addition to elegantly designed ties, Brother Edgar has a collection of bow ties and complimentary pocket squares that will round up your look. If you have been looking for beautiful, high quality Masonic apparel, look no further. Visit MasonicRevival.com. I, I, I wish that the brothers that listen to, to our conversation, they, they're able to see this for what, it's, for what it's worth and not see it as an external problem. This is something that we all have to individually contribute to changing. Exactly. And exactly. It is a lot of work, but if we all do a little bit in pushing this experience in that direction, we'll have much more effect than the effect expected from any other initiative. Right. You know, it's interesting. I read a Hey, these things pop up occasionally, and I read a blog post by some guy a couple of weeks ago, Why I Left Freemasonry, or some such similarly titled thing. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, one of the things he was complaining about was, well, nobody ever wants to have any kind of Masonic education. Nobody ever wants to talk about symbolism. 
And the first question that comes into my mind is, okay, so did you go to the master of that lodge and say at the next meeting, I'd like to give a presentation on symbolism and have a discussion among the brothers about I'll, I'll, I'll pick one symbol and we'll discuss it for 10 minutes? Hmm. Did you do that? Hmm. Because if you didn't, you're part of the problem. That's true. Because in most cases, I, I've, I've never personally come across a master that said, no, nah, nobody's interested in that crap. Take that somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I've, ne I've never come across that. Yep, neither have I. Now, 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 in fairness, maybe somebody has, but I haven't. Yeah. And that master will be there for just one year. Exactly. So, <laughs> just wait a year and hopefully things get better. But it, exactly. It, and I remember when I, when I joined and I started noticing the lack of education, I reached out to a, to a brother. He wasn't a master yet. And his response was, you are on the level, and by, by that reason, you, are, you can reach out to your worshipful master and tell him what you're not getting out of our, our Masonic experience. So he, he told me, hold your master accountable. So, Yes, absolutely, hold your master accountable. But the flip side of that is, be prepared for that master to turn around and make you a committee of one to nice. solve the problem. <laughs> nice. So he's got a lot of crap. He's got a lot of crap on his plate. Yeah, of course. That's you know, cool. and 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 he's dealing with everything from you know Harry lost the gas bill last month to you know a, a, a father and son are in an argument, and they're both members of the lodge, and, you know, one of them punched the other one, and now one of them wants to bring charges against him. You know, he's dealing with that crap. Mm -hmm. So so you can't count on the master to also say, oh, okay, I'll start an education program. I'll get right on that. So what would you, you know, suggest to the brother that is not having that experience? Uh, he... Would you say that he needs to take initiative or get together with other brothers and bring a solution to the table if he's going to be complaining? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we're all in this together. This isn't a... Joining a lodge isn't a suicide pact. I mean, you know, it isn't a situation where, where you can sit on the sidelines and expect your officers to solve all the problems. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they're 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 staring at the ritual books trying to learn the degree for next Saturday. You know, I mean if I'm all for um something that happens in a lot of European lodges, which is where uh from one degree to the next, get in the habit of asking your candidates before he advances to the next degree, in addition to just being a parrot and repeating back his his catechism, also ask him to write, you know, maybe a one-page or maybe a two-page um, uh, presentation on on what he thought of the degree or what he what he made of the symbols that he saw, I like you that. know, or just whatever his impressions were. I like that. Um, you know, and, and if you get in that habit, that's a good place to start because it immediately starts a discussion from the sidelines, mm -hmm. you know, of, of five guys getting up and saying, well, here's, you know, that's an interesting observation. I never thought of it. Here's kind of what I thought about it when I went through, you know, and, and frankly, you'd be amazed at, at the kind of things that a new candidate sees that maybe you don't see mm. okay. and it's a good starting point to get into the habit of thinking about and talking about those kinds of topics that's very good you know it I, one thing that i really enjoy when meeting a brother that's newly initiated is that he reminds me of what i felt at the beginning and he reminds me of the things that really made an impact in my mind when i was going through the degrees regardless of how long we've been in the fraternity, it is important for us to revisit those feelings and those uh, those emotions that we experience at the beginning of our journey. Right. Now, going back right. to... Right. And, 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 you know, I, 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 I think about that 
from another standpoint. You know, you you may walk into your lodge once a month or twice a month and and walk past that peeling wallpaper and that couch from the 1940s that should be cleaned and then burned um, and never notice it just because it's been there a long time and, and you know, it's, it's become part of the camouflage and you don't even notice it. Walk into your lodge and sit through your next meeting and try and have the mindset of what you had the night that you joined. Look at it through the eyes of what you had as a brand new young mason experiencing that lodge meeting, that ritual, that building for the first time. That's because cool. that's the starting point of how to start fixing some of the problems that you have in your lodge. I really hope that brothers take that to heart and they and they really do that exercise. I think it would be very helpful if they if they really made it a, a commitment to the very next meeting for them to go through that. Um, there's a lot that can happen, I think, in, in every local lodge to make the experience better. But there's an aspect I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, a lot of brothers are spending less and less time in lodge and more and more time online. And one of the top, one of the things I wanted to, to ask you about regarding the one day classes is the seeming animosity that seems to be permeating the internet in regards to the one day classes. Yeah. Uh, yes, we know that the results of the one day classes are not, are not great, but what would you say to a brother that perhaps feels some sort of animosity or feels that a, a brother that's initiated in that manner uh, perhaps doesn't understand the degrees or or has been cheated out of uh, cheated out of, out of a, a better experience the the feeling that i had is the same feeling that i get from every single person i've ever talked to that came through a one day experience and namely that is i i i felt cheated by the experience i never want to see that done to another candidate again and let's make sure at our lodge we never send another guy through one. Mm -hmm. Everybody that goes through it says pretty much the same thing. And, and, and the truth is, one-day classes are kind of an old topic because they, they're not popular anymore. They, you know, the, the days of, of bringing 8,000 guys in in one day are long gone. That was, that was a dozen years ago. And, and now they've been pretty much reduced to little events of, of maybe 20 or 30 guys once a year as some highly vaunted grand masters class. Um, and, but, but they're, they're really just not that common anymore because of that situation, because of the guys that came through them who said, let's never do that again. So, so they're kind of, self-defeating in that respect guys that get animosity from from other masons who came through traditionally I, 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 sort of all you can do is arm them with um, telling that that complainer that you know what we don't have two classes of masons in this fraternity agreed nobody's dues card said this poor guy is a McMason, which is a term that, that I absolutely despise hearing. As I said before, in most cases, the guys who went through that way, they didn't get asked. They were just told, be there Saturday. And, and so it's, it's not generally even, it wasn't even up to them to do that. Blame the lodge, don't blame the guy. Mm -hmm. But even better, what should they do to help those brothers? Because uh, we have, when they use that term McMason, and, I, and I've heard it before and I've seen some memes made out there about them, uh, I, can, I can sense that it's almost like they're pointing a finger at, okay, well, you don't deserve the, the mysteries of masonry because you, know, you went through this little thing. That's a very negative way of handling that experience. Uh, in the polar opposite, it would be perhaps offering some sort of advice on how to make up for the uh, 
Um, part of it is taking part, learning a ritual part, basically prove that you can do the work and, and, and you know, prove that, that you are every bit as, as eager and excited and willing to take part in the lodge as he did and probably more. Um, you know, unfortunately, you can't, you can't change human nature. And and if if a guy walks in with with that prejudice in his head against somebody who came through that way, um, you're not going to change his mind unless you become a terrific master or you become a terrific ritualist. Um, but if you're just a sideliner that that shows up three months out of the year and then finally walks away. Um, that's only going to reinforce it in in the heads of of the detractors that that yeah you know these guys are a waste of our time. That's very good. Um, and and that's unfortunate. I you know that onus that onus isn't on a guy who came through traditionally, but it is against the one day class guys through no fault of their own. Mm-hmm. You know, um, okay. Prince Hall was a one day mason. Oh, I didn't know you know, <laughs> and 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 before the introduction of the master mason degree, uh, the the editor press and fellow craft were generally conferred on the same night. You know, I mean, this isn't this isn't a new situation. It's just things changed, and and then they changed again. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's just it helps to be armed with with the facts behind it mm-hmm. just because you you might be faced with that argument but but the best way to do it is just simply fight back by by being better than them mm-hmm. and sometimes people forget uh which this is something that of course i didn't know before joining that you receive your degree and then you prove your proficiency so mm-hmm. the day after the initiation of the of an entered apprentice the it's going to be the same for the day after the one day class uh, participant they receive right. these degrees for which they have no uh real life application yet they just uh-huh. went through something they saw and now it's it's in their it's in their plate to actually take the steps necessary to learn decipher apply and then share so right Everybody is in the on the same boat. The only difference is that, okay, they got three degrees in one day. You got just one. Now, right. the next step is for you to put this stuff to practice. Right. Now we're running. Uh, we're reaching the end of our time. I wanted to ask you a couple of things about the similarities with the one day class and the festivals and the higher degrees of masonry. Uh, I went through a two-day festival for my Scottish Rite and right. a three-day for my York Rite. So it, I had the experience. It felt like I was drinking out of a, a, a fire hose, how they say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, do you think is something that the pitfalls of the one-day class are similar to the pitfalls of structuring the higher degrees in this manner? Well, I think that's certainly where the idea came from. I, I think that was that was when they when they first started doing them. That was their justification. Well, the Scottish Rite does it this way, and they always have. Um, <clears throat> you know, as, as opposed to Europe, where it takes years to go through uh, the Scottish Rite or the Rectified Rite, and and uh, frequently you won't find thirty second degree Masons in Europe. Um, you know, I, I mean, a lot of guys stop at like the 18th degree and, you know, it's, um, it's just a different mindset here. Um, and, and particularly, are, are you in the Southern jurisdiction or the Northern? In the Southern. Yeah. The Southern jurisdiction. Yeah. You talk about drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, <laughs> the, the information that is just thrown at you in the course of a couple of days 
is is just absolutely overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, an, an interesting fact: yeah. the only time in my life that I have had caffeine pills was <laughs> <laughs> during my Scottish Rite uh, <laughs> festival. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and it's and that's that's not going to change. Uh, the the in particular the Scottish Rite. I, you know, I, I was lucky. I went through uh, my York Rite degrees very slowly. Um, I uh, my my uh, um, uh, my chapter degrees were were spread out over two months, and I mean I, it took me almost a year to get through my York Rite degrees. That's good. So so I was pretty lucky in that respect. Um, but yeah, the Scottish Rite just throws it at you, and and particularly in the southern jurisdiction, uh, with all the symbolism that that Pike heaped on the degrees, it's just mind numbing at that point. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and 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 brother, if as as we say goodbye, I wanted to ask you if you have if we have a brother that is young to masonry and is listening to to our conversation, if you have one piece of advice on how he could utilize this information to become the best version possible of himself, what would that be? I put it this way. I freely admit to anybody that I talk to, I say it at every talk that I ever give, and I'll tell anybody that asks me, I consider myself to be truly the luckiest guy in all of the history of the fraternity just because of what happened to me. A one-day class guy winds up becoming a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason and, and the author of a book that becomes hugely popular worldwide is proof that if you don't think that one guy can't do anything to change this fraternity and make a difference, I'm here to tell you one guy can't. One single mason can accomplish an awful lot if he's really and truly dedicated to doing it. Yes, you heard it right. Brother Chris Hoda, the author of Freemasons for Dummies, a 33rd degree mason, that brother to whom we look for for inspiration and for Masonic light is a one day conferral member. See, the fact that he was brought up to light as a one-day participant didn't change the fact that if he had the zeal, the dedication, the desire to improve himself in masonry, he was able to make a great difference in his life and in the life of everyone who surrounds him. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and you find this conversation edifying. I certainly did. If you have any questions or comments about today's conversation, I invite you to participate in the conversations that happen on the Winding Stairs Freemasonry group on Facebook, as well as the Winding Stairs page. I once again want to thank Brother Hodap for being so generous with his time and with his light and for spending a little bit of time with us to help us become better men and masons. A special thanks goes out to Billy Mays III of Infinite Third for providing some of the music that you've heard today on this episode. You can check out his entire collection by going to infinitethird.com. I will include links to his and all the other websites on the show notes. A special thanks to Brother Edgar from MasonicRevival.com for being generous and being a sponsor of this show, helping it continue uh, moving forward and publishing more episodes. To see his high collection, go to MasonicRevival.com. If you enjoyed The Winding Stairs, there are many ways in which you can support it. The easiest one is for you to share this audio with your friends and brothers through social media. You can also discuss the conversations that we have here on your own blog or website. Another way that you can support this program is by going to FreemasonryArt.com and looking at the collection of art, Masonic regalia, and apparel that I've put together for you. Lately, I've been working on creating some designs for t-shirts, the kind of t-shirts that I would like to own, and I think that you'll enjoy some of those. I even started a program where if your lodge wants to have a custom-made shirt that has the lodge name and number on it, I can do that for you for free. 
Just go to thewindingstairs.com forward slash mylodgeshirt for more information. And until next time, may your steps be firm and your path illuminated as we continue our journey up the winding stairs. <laughs>